Welcome to a special conversation of Lead on Read on the Read podcast. Read connects you with researchers, educators, and thought leaders who share their work and expertise on education and child development. Read is produced by the Windward Institute. I'm your host, Danielle Gomez, and I am joined by my co-host. Actually, again, Lead on Read, you don't get one episode, one host, you get two. Yeah. So I am joined by my co-host, Jamie Williamson. Hello, Jamie. Hello, hello. I get to crash the party from time to time, so it's uh, always fun to be here. I know, and I noticed that the audience can see our red because it is Valentine's Day. A little, little color popping up. Yeah. Pocket square. This won't come so. out until August, but I, not August, April, but, um, you know, I like to share the love of like a yeah. holiday, you know what yeah. I mean? Like we love research, we love reading research, we love our guest, and so... You know, that lead dives into topics on leadership and asks the essential question, what does it mean to be a leader in education right now? And we're obsessed with change management. We're obsessed with leadership and how we're going to learn about how to navigate school reform and those skills that leaders need. And so we're joined by a, a true expert, Dr. Sarah Wolfen. Dr. Wolfen, thank you and welcome to the Read Podcast. Thank you so much for for having me. It's great to to be here and I'm excited to share a bit about what I've been thinking and working on uh, with regard to leadership for um, reading instructional improvement. Thank you. And I guess you should start to set the scene first. I want to ask both of you, how are you showing up today? So co-host, Jamie, how do you feel about this conversation? Well, one, I'm, I'm excited. I think that when we think about the science of reading, we have so many conversations about the components and the training and the work that needs to happen on the teacher training side of this. But sometimes I think the conversation around leadership get left out a little bit. And uh, I'm just really glad to spend a little time focusing on that and how do we help build capacity amongst building leaders, district level leaders, independent school leaders, all in service of doing really great work for kids. And so I think this is a, a really impactful piece here. So I'm just, I'm excited to dive into the conversation a little bit. Yeah, I love framing that that way. Dr. Wolfen, how are you showing up to this conversation? In many ways, building on that and also kind of going back to your your love theme, I think that uh, for those of us who... Um, love kids and love kind of the idea and potential of their sort of how reading fits into their future development. And for those of us who really kind of love evidence-based reading instruction and kind of school improvement efforts, um, there's this need to also really kind of love and understand kind of the systems and infrastructure and supportive conditions um, that helps the adults kind of get on the same page and do the work that they both want and need to do to ensure that kids and communities have the outcomes that they really need. So I see a lot of us really thinking about um, thinking about these systems and finding ways to kind of love and and nurture and sustain these systems yeah. um, to improve reading. I love that. Thank you. And I mean, we're sitting here at one of our, our campuses at Westchester Lower School at the Windward School. And I love how you talked about the going from the child to the teacher to the system. Mm -hmm. um, I feel really invigorated right now. But I do want to introduce you to our read listeners. Um, I told you in our little pre-interview chat about how just we were diving into your research work. Um, the Windward Institute team, Jamie, myself, everyone really loves the work that you're doing and we're excited to share it with our read listeners. So I'm going to read your bio first and then we'll get into some questions. How does that sound? Sounds wonderful. Excellent. So Dr. Sarah Wolfen is an associate professor, associate professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy at UT Austin who studies the relationship between education policy and equitable instruction. Much of her work draws on the research practice partnership approach to formulate relevant questions, engage with practitioners in substantive ways, and transform practice. Using, lens of, using a lens of organizational sociology and qualitative methods, Dr. Wolfen investigates pressing issues of district and school reform, including how to strengthen instructional coaching and improve instruction. Ooh, instructional coaching, I get excited. Uh, while, while analyzing the instructional structures and organizational conditions of districts and schools, she focuses on how leaders and teachers implement policy, and her research illuminates how infrastructure and leadership influence educational change. Her work has been published in a number of outlets that we'll have on the Read Podcast website, and she also co-authored Making Coaching Matters. Um, Dr. Wolfen is a former public school teacher and reading coach where she was dedicated to strengthening student li literacy skills to promote equi equitable outcomes. This is my favorite part of your bio. As a scholar, her commitment to raising the quality of instruction for all students across all schools motivates her research on how policy shapes the work of district leaders, principals, coaches, and teachers. So your commitment is right in line with our commitment and the values that we share 
Would you like to start with our first question? Yeah, you know, as I'm I'm thinking about this love theme, so thank you so much for kind of <laughs> echoing that. We are in a currently in a lower school campus, mm -hmm. so there's a whole lot of love floating around our hallways right now. So yeah, Valentine's Day is always a fun day for for kids in that first through fifth grade range. Mm -hmm. There's still a little bit of magic there, right? Um, and I'm thinking about kind of the story of kind of professional journey here. So I, I one I, I just I mm -hmm. love the bio, and I think there's so much there we can sort of you know touch upon. Um, but I'd love to get a sense of how did you create, where did this love of the work that you're doing kind of come from? Yeah, I appreciate the, the opportunity to kind of share a bit on that. Um, so growing up, I was a science nerd, science geek. And um, in college, I was a biochemistry major, but I was doing lots of like volunteer work within schools and summer camps. And a lot of it was really linked to issues of kind of social justice and equity. And um Partially because of the science background, I was paired a lot kind of in high school, sort of doing, you know, I ended up sort of doing kind of math tutoring sorts of things in high school. And what I ended up noticing is that the students were really struggling with kind of basic skills and mm -hmm. issues and gaps. And so the notion of kind of like jumping in and learning about biology was really hard when they were really struggling with reading or with kind of basic math skills. And I started having questions about that and questions about the education system. And I decided I wanted to teach before. Um, kind of continuing on my science geek, science nerd track. Yeah. Um, and I ended up getting placed in a uh, California urban public school, um, and I was placed teaching kindergarten. I was initially supposed to be in a si middle school science position, but that position fell through. Uh -huh. And they had another opening uh, for a kindergarten teacher, and they sort of asked me, they thought I might say no. And I was like, what? I actually really remember liking my kindergarten teachers. So I'll say yes, even though it has nothing to do with science, and we'll see what happens. Um, I promise I'll speed through some parts of my oh, life no, story. No, we but, love, we and love take so, story. Okay, yes. okay. So, um, and I will also add the the, the important policy context with this is that um, this was at the peak of California's um, right after California sort of did their class size reduction policy, mm -hmm. and so they were like desperate and hungry for anyone to be within classrooms, and so. You know, this principal was super excited to have someone with no teacher ed experience exposure program, uncredentialed person to walk in the door and teach kindergarten. And that was that was me. Um, uh, over the course of the, my first year teaching kindergarten, I discovered that um, I did not like teaching science at all. Um, and right away, as soon as I was teaching science to kids and nobody told this to me, I, I was like, I'm not actually teaching science. I'm teaching reading. Mm -hmm. And same thing happened with math. I was like, yeah, I did advanced math in college and things like that. But when I was teaching kindergarten math, I wasn't actually teaching math. What am I teaching? Literacy. Yep. When I'm teaching reading, obviously I was teaching literacy. But the minute I was teaching literacy to the kindergartners, seeing like those steps and those light bulbs go, seeing like the building from, and again, um, the school that I was teaching at was like 97% free and reduced lunch. I think about 70% of the students um, were emergent bilingual students. Um, really, really under-resourced, both district and school. We were really, we were taking donations of copy paper from random like offices. Like there was nothing in terms of infrastructure and, and such in place um, or very, very little, really kind of like scraping, scrapping by. Um, but seeing the steps that kids took and took from like recognizing one letter in their name all the way to like reading sentences, you know, weeks, months later, I was like, this is it. I am hooked on whatever it takes yeah. to do this and to see kids growth. And that was, that was reading and literacy. And so I ended up um, staying at that school for six years. Um, I taught kindergarten and second grade and then was a reading first reading coach for three years. Um, in that reading first coaching role, um, I was brought together with other reading coaches from across the state of California, learned a lot about kind of some of it implicitly, some of it very explicitly, how we talk about curriculum, how we talk about coherence, how and why different districts were having more or less pushback when it came to curriculum adoption and reading instructional improvement. Um, and that just became super interesting to me. And that led me to go to grad school and study kind of education policy to understand these things. and understand how we study these sorts of curriculum change efforts. Um, but the core of it was really kind of realizing that all instruction in the early grades is literacy instruction. Yeah. No offense to, I no, know that no. there are early childhood 
science and math folks, and that's an important domain and space. Um, but my lens or spin on it was that um, so much of it was sort of rooted in literacy and that those literacy, that literacy development and those literacy outcomes in those early years are going to shape and color outcomes all the way through, whether it's a high school science class or, yeah. That's outstanding. So I, one, thank you so much. I think it's a beautiful story. I love when you hear like professional journeys that sort of start in one place, end up in a very different place through this uh, this process of experience, this process of exposure, this process of kind of defining and seeing the passion uh, in that work. And so I and I'm just thinking to myself, you know, coming in with the idea of being a middle school science teacher, mm-hmm. you you almost couldn't ask for a more opposite experience to go into a kindergarten classroom, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's a it's such a beautiful thing. So I really, really appreciate that. But I, I do think that uh, I'm just going to sort of get a, a big tee up here. I think the the most interesting journeys are ones that are never sequential and linear, right? Mm-hmm. They're a little bit all over. Um, I'm a I'm a psychologist by training, and I went to I went to graduate school, but I wanted to be an experimental psychologist, and then found myself like working through the process of of really kind of coming into schools and thinking about things a little bit differently. And it's it's been a wonderful journey in that. So I think. Sometimes in the professional work, you have to buckle in and see where the work takes you and see where your passions mm-hmm. take you and sort of seeing the need in the world and finding ways to kind of identify and meet that need as you move along. So thank can you. I, thank can you. I add one other? Yeah, I think something please. that really kind of builds on this is that um, something that I've noticed and actually goes to both reading and to coaching in my research and in my practice experience. There have been moments professionally where I've said, you know, I'm not quite as interested in reading anymore. You yeah. know, I'll kind of, I'm going to switch and study more on teacher evaluation. Uh-huh. And you know what the heck happens? I start doing a study on teacher evaluation. What do folks end up talking about? They talk about how how are they evaluating teachers' reading instruction? Yeah. Or, mm-hmm. you know, same thing. All of a sudden, I'm like, well, you know, maybe I don't want to study coaching. Maybe I want to study curriculum yeah. implementation. Well, start up a project on curriculum implementation. And all they want to talk about, when I actually collect the data, it's actually about what are the coaches doing to support curriculum implementation? Or yep. how is the reading curriculum going? And so it's like, even when I try to veer away, what ends up, you know, popcorning back up or percolating back up is sort of those, um, you know, the big rock of reading yeah. instructional improvement and how coaches fit into that too. Um, so yeah. I love how you said that because I'm the same way. Like I think, feel like every day I need to draw this mind map and it just constantly yeah. expands. It's beyond a map at this yeah. point. Like maybe it's a solar system. But I think what you're what you come to and you you drew back to that idea of coherence is all of these things. And I think one of the things that gets me so passionate, especially in the work of implementation science or translational research, is that these are all all these mechanisms are related. Right. That it's a yes. And that it's not just reading research with the folks on on this part of the map. It's not just the folks doing the work in organizational soci- like so um, psychology. It's not just the folks that are perhaps even doing. The economics of education, right? Yep. I could go down a, a tangent of some of the brilliant work that Matt Kraft at um, Brown University yep. is doing on teacher coaching, and he studies quantitative methods. And you're here, you know, br- bridging a lot of that. And so, um, I, I do want to dive into that before I I'm going to go in an hour yeah, of yeah. that. I think <laughs> I do want to get into that, and I love how you brought that up so early. Um, but I think circling back to what you talked about in your professional career. Um, a lot of the conversations that I've been learning about with Jamie and some of our leaders that we've interviewed is this idea that leadership isn't an outcome and it's not even, I mean, you identify as a leader, right? But it's more of this process of just of ma- towards mastery, right? This ever-changing, continuous, non-linear path towards being someone who serves in this role. Um, and I think it's being a leader in reading education right now is so critical in terms of leading reform. And there's just such an an incredible need to focus on what leaders need to do to navigate reform. And so um, from your perspective, from your career, from where you are now in your in your role and in your research, what do you think it means to be a leader in education right now? Yeah, well, first, I kind of want to give some kudos that um, I hear you taking a step that sometimes in the field of education, we don't do. And what that step is, is that you are paying attention to what the leader is actually doing. Like, what are the concrete action steps that a person is actually doing to drive change? Mm -hmm. And I really distinguish that from this very kind of like nebulous concept of like leadership that almost then doesn't parse it out to who is doing what. Um, So a push that I have kind of within kind of the ed 
leadership realm is to really kind of shift to the like, who is doing what to reach what goal and being like as concrete and spe specific as possible. And so thinking about within kind of improving reading instruction, who is framing ideas about how and why we might need a different curriculum, who is um, creating conditions so that there is time in the teacher schedule for PLCs that are, you know, appropriately structured and supported and monitored and all of that um, over the course of the year. Um, who is then supporting the people who are supporting teachers? And it becomes this sort of nested, you know, recursive system of like, and who is supporting them? And who is, yeah. you know, um, and so I think that might be like a long weird way to answer your question. But, um, you know, I, I think that really the shift of like being really kind of active and understanding that um, people in education kind of across levels, whether a coach, um, a professional learning director, a superintendent, um, a head of school, um, even a teacher, le informal teacher leader, they're all they all have multiple kind of decision points and multiple ways that they can take steps that kind of really enable reading instructional improvement or that either purposely or inadvertently kind of create barriers for it for other people and um, and so yeah it, it obviously encouraging the the types of leadership practices that uh that do kind of enable reading instructional improvement feels really important at this moment yeah I love that you sort of highlighted that every step in that kind of that chain, right? Because mm -hmm. it, yep. you know, often now we talk about the idea of this work is far bigger than any of us will ever be, right? Yep. Like as a, as one human being, we can have some, we can have an impact in the space. And the more we kind of come together, link our arms and sort of try to put our arms around a big meaty problem like this. But we we do need to be supporting each other and thinking about the support that every level of this work has to, yep. and, and has available to it. Um, and, I think, and I think within there, there is some notions around relationships and psychological safety and the ability to to really think through, um, you know, progress versus perfection, right? Mm -hmm. to, to come up and say, there is, there's lots and lots of ways to do things. Some, as you pointed out earlier, maybe better than others. Some may be inadvertently yep. getting the way of the practice um, and trying, because I do think that the world right now that we are currently finding ourselves in feels like there's a lot of just general anxiety, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, both in terms of the uh, just the world atmosphere, I think, in, in our day to day work post pandemic, you know, trying to find ways to relate to each other after you know some some challenging times. But I do think that that notion of creating that safety and that lens of support for folks, and also being carefully being careful about how you we talk about the skills that are needed to be successful in that space, and providing some of that clarity for folks. Mm -hmm. I just could not agree more. So. And Thank that you. collective responsibility too, I think is important, yeah. right? Is that at least in some of the, in a lot of the literature I was reading on professional development, you know, frameworks of professional development, coaches, um, even just met distributed leadership or leadership frameworks, you see this collective responsibility coming up again and again in terms of like mm -hmm. school, whole school reform, whole school change. Um, so I wanted to add that I like that you brought in that not only like collectively seeing each other and the value that everyone brings, but that responsibility yeah. too reach that end goal. Yeah. I, I'm sort of obsessed with that collectively seeing each other phrase. Mm -hmm. I may need to borrow sure. it and quote that and or just quote it. I won't borrow it. I'll just quote you. Um, because it actually reminds me of a really important, um, it was an aha when I was a reading coach and then it really stretched through and became an important theme um, as a graduate student. Um, this idea of like breaking down the egg create structure of schools mm -hmm. and really kind of like that whole, that big metaphor of like opening up the classroom door. Um, yeah. But like as a coach, you physically open up the classroom door and are there. And I know that sounds hokey, but like, to me, it goes to that, like that, um, you know, that breaks down these walls where people can collectively see what does instruction look like? What does it look like when your class is engaged in a really high level discussion? Yeah. What does it sound like when first graders are all scribbling away in their writer's notebooks and like, don't want to stop when time is over. Right. Like, um, and you can describe it till the cows come home. You can show a video, you can, pull something down from YouTube, but like there's something different about when you're actually like opening up the classroom door and collectively kind of seeing and experiencing those steps yep. in the change process. And, and I just think it's a, a yeah, 
kind of a powerful step and a powerful way to think about kind of how learning happens. And then I've also become really interested in thinking about what are the back steps? What are the conditions that need to be in place so that people feel really comfortable doing that? Yeah. Or maybe if they don't feel comfortable right away, that they're on a continuum to feeling that yeah. they understand kind of the benefits and um, can be open about that so that everybody improves. Yeah. There's definitely a cultural component to that. I think mm -hmm. finding school yep. spaces where educators can feel the support of that coaching in that moment. Um, you know, one of our core values as an organization um, and as a leader, I, I just a really big believer in the idea that we should be living and, and breathing in our values, right? Mm -hmm. You should be able to see those things in action on a day-to-day -day basis. And we talk about growth here and the idea of showing up from a point of progress understanding my strengths and weaknesses, understanding the areas where I need to grow, being open to that feedback and starting to work through that process. I do think sometimes some of the school improvement efforts have kind of forgotten that in some spaces. When you yeah. come into a school that, you know, I'm going to put air quotes up here, uh, kind of maybe failing from a test score standpoint, and you want to have some real reform in this space. And I think we come in sort of guns a blazing, uh, you know, metaphorically, not really, but like come into a space where we're like, you're do everything you're doing is wrong. And it has to stop tomorrow. And I think for for educators, that's not a safe place to kind of reside in. Yep. So we have to help them kind of see that there are some things in there that I'm sure they're doing well, like highlighting those important pieces and bringing to helping help, helping them kind of bring to bear on some observations of themselves and some reflections to say, you know, now that I've learned this practice, I don't see this in my my own practice. And how do I start to integrate that? But it's been... It's been a fascinating conversation as we've worked with some school districts or some schools and some of our training work and external pieces, mm -hmm. kind of hearing some of those, the um, uh, the residual trauma, if you will, from some of those kind of really challenging, hard, sort of top-down reform acts that have come through the process of some of these public schools. So, Yeah, I think you bring up an interesting point. And I think what Jamie now is getting into this reform piece, right, and that Reform. First of all, I'm fascinated by change in general from the individual level mm -hmm. to the group to the organization level. Um, and what a, I shouldn't even say fascinating, but what an interesting example to look at change in reading research and how that's implemented in schools. Um, a lot of the work that we do at the Institute is not only communicating the research and what's effective in teaching reading and what we know about reading research and how kids literacy skills develop. But then what are those, like you said, those conditions, those cultures, even the aspect of coherence is what it, that is needed to sustain change. And so um, your expertise is obviously in, in school reform and improvement. And I think from a practitioner's lens, it holds a lot of weight. When I think of reform, sometimes my shoulders go up and I'm like, what does that even mean for me in the classroom? And it it is it, it is such a, a, a weighty term in terms of current discourse. So what do you think, I think, what do you think the overall discourse in reading reform, let's say, um, might under, underestimate or leave out in this, in this current conversation that we're having? That is a wonderful question. I think there are, there are a couple. I think one that I'm going to, that I'm going to jump into that I think actually links a little bit to my, my hint about being a reading first reading coach mm -hmm. is history. And by that, I mean, you know, not reading all the history books about how reading instruction has transpired, but more so how um, many teachers, many educators, they're not brand new. This is not their first wave of um, or first swing of the reading pendulum, if you will. So teachers have experienced and principals and even district leaders, they've heard multiple sets of messages over multiple years about what programs to use and why and how to measure effectiveness and how to coach. And um, I have a fairly recent piece with Natalie Spitzer. Where we talk about even how within one district over like a five-year period, there were actually three different models of instructional coaching. Wow. So coaching is not coaching is not coaching. And imagine if you are a teacher and you've been in that district for just five years. Some, some teachers are probably in that district for 10 years even before that. They probably had for other versions of coaching before or no coaching and coaching on. It's um, there's just this blizzard of messages and change, whether it's about coaching or reading instruction. And I think that sometimes with reform, um, I think as part of the messaging and as part of the, um, you know, kind of the, the triumphal announcement, this is a new thing. Mm -hmm. We forget that folks have been through many other 
new things and they have tried other new things. And so I think a really important step that is oftentimes skipped is being really clear and mapping on. In the past, we were doing A, B, and C. Now we're going to do C, F, and G, right? There might be some mix and match. Um, you might be holding on to some of the previous stuff, and that needs to be really clear to folks. And then you also have to be really clear where, what are the things that you're discontinuing and what is really going to be new? Um, and I think that that's, that really links to this, this idea that um, kind of the history of this of, of layers of reforms, of layers of press, pressures, of layer of messages really need to be attended to. Um, I think the one other piece, uh, not to keep on going back to the, the leadership thread and theme, I think that there are pockets and places where folks who are talking about reading for reform right now are paying full attention to leaders and leadership, but I would argue not quite enough. Yeah. And again, when talking about leaders and leadership, a little bit kind of to my earlier point, really thinking broadly and expansively that it's, you know, everyone from the superintendent to the director of academics to the principal supervisors to the coaches and really thinking through like how are leaders at each of those levels and how are those leaders that are carrying out a variety of tasks that link to the reading reform? What are they doing? How are they supported to do that work? How do they not just understand the reading reform, but how do they understand aspects of organizational change and aspects of high-quality professional learning and aspects of individual sense-making. Um, so how do they understand those change processes too? Yeah, I think that that's wonderful. And I, I completely agree. I think there needs to be a lot more focus. We have conversations with area districts um, and educational leaders and the training for those folks in terms of how to understand the work, yep. how to understand what the right step forward happen, would be, how to understand how to link up good knowledge from superintendent down to an instructional coach and having everybody clear about what's happening and the why behind it. And I just so appreciate your sort of focus on that idea of linking up previous work. Because I do mm -hmm. think sometimes that is one of the things we forget because we don't want, we almost don't want to talk about it. We don't want to acknowledge yeah. the elephant in the room that we know there've been 15 attempts at making this better and they've mm -hmm. all made you miserable, right? <laughs> Like, yeah. And they've pulled you in probably many, many different ways. It's like the the flavor of the minute. Yeah. Um, and that's where I, I think this idea of translational science and that understanding that support and helping people see where the good was, because there's there's good in so many practices, mm -hmm. you know, seeing where the good was, where the new where the new learning is and where the changes clearly mm -hmm. are in one approach between one approach. I think it helps ground that why. So I so appreciate your focus on that. Yeah. And to add to that, too, I love the piece of trans being transparent with the why. And yeah. a few questions will ask you. I want to ask you about transparency and current leadership frameworks. But the other piece that really struck me was this aspect of de-implementation in the sense of I actually wrote a paper. We have a um, an annual journal called The Beacon where we synthesize a lot of current research. And in the previous um, paper, I wrote about de-implementation and in the through the lens of not removing everything that when you're de-implementing, you could be restoring something that may have been ha happening. You could kind of value something that had already been happening, but you're not completely removing everything and starting anew, right? We never do that in education. And I think almost like it requires a leader to see beyond those binaries of either we remove it or we keep it going, right? And kind of see where, like you said, how can we facilitate the conditions and the processes and continue the the value of the agency that's happening in, in classrooms and in mm -hmm. schools um, in order to really continue to move the change forward. Um, so I did want to add that piece to it. Do, do you have any, I saw you nodding your head. Is there something you wanted to to respond to that with de-implementation? No, but I, I do, I, I appreciate kind of also the attention to kind of the agency that, that mm -hmm. people do have space and wiggle room and, you know, these reforms, they're not trying to sort of force a cookie cutter approach. I think sometimes we say the word reform or anyone says the word reform and there can be kind of this like panic moment and kind of angst moment versus, you know, people are going to have agency no matter what the reform is, you know, but it's more about how are we learning from that? How are we continuously improving from that? And yeah, I think I, a, I, I, yeah. There's a paper I wrote, I think it was Calvert 2016 when my doctorate work basically saying that School professional development fails if it fails to tap into teacher agency. I think I'll have that linked on the read podcast, but it kind of speaks to that, right? Like, you know, 
and a lot of the PD work that we do at the school and then le- outwardly to the Institute is making sure that there's that relationship piece, that agency piece, that that why of I'm doing this for the ultimate goal of my students. And even f- building up with some of those resources yeah. and systems to make sure that not only the knowledge is there, but the belief that they can actually implement it in a way that is keeping with like, you know, I, I don't want to say fidelity of the research, but ensuring that it's in it's in a way that is maintaining with the research itself and with the effective methods, I think is important. Do you want to add to anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think it's a really important part of that. And, you know, I'm also thinking about the article that uh, I spent a little time with and kind of prep, preparing for this. A little bit of writing you've done, sort of thinking about this idea of infrastructure and all the stuff mm-hmm. that needs to come together, right? There, there are, are no, there's only complex problems, mm-hmm. and there's, there's, there's rarely simple solutions, right? Mm-hmm. But I do think straightforward and clear solutions often win the day for me. <laughs> so we can have a solution that is so terribly complex. But I love how, uh, and I think it, I, we found so much alignment in this thinking. The idea of really aligning PD work, aligning curriculum, and then thinking about supporting leaders as that mm-hmm. the old proverbial three-legged stool here, right? Yes. So if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the pillars and how those pillars and how they really apply in this space and, you know, not to be all gloom and doom, because I'm sure that uh, we can talk about the challenges of implementing that all day long. Mm-hmm. But if you have any sort of like insider stories or some success stories that you've seen in your work, I'd love to kind of maybe lift those up a little bit in a moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so th- thank you for that feedback on the the infrastructural work. And so this is work that I did um, with Rachel Gabriel. And, you know, we set forth that there's sort of these three really important pillars of infrastructure, the first being um, reading curriculum and using that term broadly to include both kind of instructional materials as well as um, assessments, as well as kind of instructional guidance would all fall under that curriculum pillar. Um, and the second pillar... Um, being professional development. And again, I'm purposely using this sort of ordering that the professional development is on reading and not just on reading, it's actually on the reading curriculum. So really tracing out and imagining that there would be multiple forms of professional learning opportunities, everything from takeoff workshops to PLC meetings to coaching that's aligned and directly tied to, again, the reading curriculum, the reading assessments, the reading instructional pedagogical guidance, um, and really kind of tracing that out, that those things are, are hand in hand. And, and last but not least, the leadership pillar is sort of the how leaders are creating conditions for the high quality PD to occur kind of on reading curriculum. Um, and this is sort of the, the space and the activities where leaders are kind of explaining the big why. Why are we adopting a new curriculum? Leaders are involved in collecting various forms of evidence from kind of street data to more traditional quantitative data on how students are doing. How are they responding to different curricular materials? Um, How are teachers responding to using different curricular materials? Um, How are teachers responding to different PDs? How are coaches perceiving the quality and nature of the PD that they're getting on on reading? Um, I think something that I'm intentionally doing is really kind of threading through that, that alignment kind of across um, and I'm, I'm trying to think of a few, a few success stories. I know that, um, I know in a couple Texas districts, they have taken some steps, um, uh, that they've taken steps where kind of across district leaders, as well as school leaders, as well as teachers are all kind of they're coming together for curriculum focused reading PD. Um, and it's been a shift in the district to have sort of district leaders and school leaders kind of together with teachers. So it kind of goes to that collective yeah. learning and sense making. So it's not district leaders are sent off for something else, but there's been sort of this new kind of push and expectation that folks will be in the room together to learn about the curricular program. Um, so I'm gonna use that as one example. And I think I'll pause there for my example. Yeah. Well, yeah. I wanted to dive in because I think that was an interesting example you brought in. First of all, can I just give you a shout out for street data? <laughs> I am going to now yeah. quote you with uh, that. I love how you referred to the qualitative data as street data because it's like 
I mean, I know Brene Brown says that qualitative data is data with a story, but I love that that term. So I just wanted to tell you, I'm going to quote you with that. Oh, and I should I should say that street data is it's the name of a fantastic book by um, Dugan and Safir. Okay. Um, so it's called Street Data: A Next Generation Model for Equity and Pedagogy. Um, oh. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. I'm yeah, I'd be happy to. If you Google it, street data, uh, it'll oh, yeah. come up with the book. book. And yeah, and it has a really, um, it offers really nice examples. And it actually goes to sort of, it explains how leaders um, can collect different forms of data and how that can really kind of complement and give them kind of richer insights into what's actually happening so that they can then it. create uh, stronger strategic plans um, and provide more tailored supports. Yeah. For improvement. Yeah. So I actually want to do a little sidebar to my co-host right here because I have some questions on some conditions, but I know yeah. how much you immerse yourself. You write and you are really interested in data. So yeah. do you want to ask Dr. Wolfen more about the conditions that might facilitate or do you have other another question on data? Well, I want to, yeah. So she she's very right. I, I, I am a science nerd as well. Yeah. I love data. I love statistics. Uh, and sometimes I can go down rabbit holes uh, that uh, few want to follow. So um, but before I before I ask that question, actually, I just I want to take a moment to really appreciate something that you said, um, this idea of being in the room together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, coming out uh, in my my career, I spent some years running a mental health clinic in schools, years as a school psychologist evaluating kids. Uh, I spent seven years as a principal of an independent school program. And in that process, one of the things that I found to be so valuable, and I did this work when I was a school psychologist working on district level kind of initiatives around reading or or literacy or whatever the change assessment happened to be. Um, but when I was a, a principal, you know, when we were we would do things, professional development, on, on enhancing the reading work that we were doing or the writing work or the math work, one of the things that was always so important to me was to be in that room, sitting with my teachers, hearing the same things, making sure I understood to a great degree what was happening in that conversation. So that way, you know, like, like for instance, we, we brought in uh, a researcher out of Penn State who we love and adore here, Paul Riccamini. Uh, to my school a few times, and Paul's on our advisory board, and he does one of the one of the stronger math PDs uh, for teachers that I've seen in my career. Mm -hmm. He just he connects in such a great way, and but I sat through every single one of those with him um, because I wanted to make sure that when he was long uh, out of the of the building for that day or that week or that month, then I had a chance to reinforce some of those messages and understand the work. I'm never going to be the math teacher that you know uh, one of my teachers was going to be but I could help sort of provide some backstop for that support and that understanding. Maybe we could reflect in some interesting ways. Um, but I do think that's a, sometimes a missing spot in our busyness of school leadership mm -hmm. in the space where we all have, you know, about 5 million more things on our plate than we probably need at any given point. And I think sometimes those moments are we, we, we take an active step back and say, you know, that that's a teacher focused one. I don't need to go there, but I do think there's some real, um, real value to that, not only in terms of some of the informal sort of conversational pieces of that you can sort of help move this along, but the, I'm going to sort of uh, keep with the street uh, kind of theme here, yeah. but you get some street cred with folks, right? Mm -hmm. That you are in this with them and it's this is not a done to, it's a done with. And I think that's a, yep. just I couldn't highlight that enough. So, And a quick add, I would sort of add that then leaders can also do some really important modeling of like, I'm still yeah. learning too. And this, this, some mm -hmm. of this is new and I actually have questions about this and yeah, I'm curious about this and maybe I even have a little bit of pushback, right? Yeah. Like, and that that's, there can be some modeling within that, that then helps teachers and others in the room sort of notice, yeah. oh, okay. I could also, it's okay to be a little bit confused by this yeah. or yeah. And I and we we do not emphasize that kind of learning and, and the importance of those experiences or sharing, being vulnerable enough to mm -hmm. share our yeah. sort of worries and concerns about something, even as we're working through the process of, of supporting something. Yep. Um, so I just one thank you for that. Um, you know, on the on the data side of this, I do think there's so much, uh, so many ways to think about how do you collect evidence along the way to kind of help support, whether that's teacher knowledge, whether that's student outcomes, and linking those things up. Um, and I think sometimes in schools, we do miss an opportunity to really highlight because there's there's qualitative data, which is great. It's mm -hmm. great to get a, a big sort of meta-analysis of a large group of data, right? Like it's really that there's some, there's some benefit to looking at things from that perspective. There's some questions that one can answer. But I also think sometimes we forget about the importance of some of the qualitative research that we can do or the 
Um, you know, the, it's what folks in schools are calling this action-based moments, right? Where I'm doing an action-based research project to kind of see how this worked in my space. Mm -hmm. And I think that we forget that even though that may not have an N of 5,000 kids, it actually still has some value in the conversation when we understand the limitations and the, the kind of the guardrails about how that data comes to bear and what we can do with that data from a conclusion or generalization standpoint. Um, any tips for, you know, as you think about kind of coaching leaders on that, because I, I have seen data for some school leaders is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. Like they sometimes deny any of the the challenges in, in some of the reading outcomes and say things like, well, our kids are doing okay enough, right? They're in the, they're in the average range on whatever state assessment or whatever mm -hmm. the marker for outcome that a school has identified. Um, but how do we get some, some school leaders to maybe be a little bit more curious about the data side and dig in just a little bit deeper? That's a wonder, wonderful question. Uh, um, I think there are a few things. And um, I think one thing that sometimes I'm, I find a little bit head scratching is, and it almost goes to the siloing again. I think sometimes yeah. um, leaders and others within the education system sort of look at one pool of data at a time. And sometimes it's one data system at a time even. So in some of my teaching and district leadership programs, I ask folks to actually do kind of a, an audit or an analysis of their district's data infrastructure and data systems. And what comes up within just that assignment is that sometimes data systems don't even talk to each other within large districts. Uh -huh. And so what ends up happening is folks look at one slice, like they'll look at their NWA map reading data in isolation and not pair it up with like the state test scores, or they don't pair it up with internal curriculum assessments. Um, and I think it's really important to do that sort of mix and match, obviously not completely, you know, hodgepodge, yeah. haphazard, but in sort of thoughtful, intentional ways to say, okay, so what does this mean that on NWA map, students are here, so reading growth is looking like this. However, on our curriculum-based assessments, we're noticing this. Um, I think that tells us something about the assessments, but I think it also tells us something about what's happening with an instruction and ultimately gives us more insights about what's happening yeah. Um, for kids and what what kids need um, for even kind of greater longer term outcomes than either moving the needle on map or on um, yeah. the curriculum based assessments. Um, so I think that's that's one important slice. Um, I think another thing for data use to be useful is that there needs to be time to not just sort of like run the report and see the report either with from one assessment or across multiple assessments. Um, but to really like create kind of the action plan, but then also have time for what is the capacity building that happens that really maps onto that action plan and making sure that it's really aligned to it. Um, in a project that I'm doing related to turnaround school, something that I've noticed is that there isn't always um, a complete fit between, you know, the data says there's a gap in something related to, you know, vocabulary. Yeah. And then the PD might not necessarily be vocab specific. The PD ends up being much broader and actually goes uh -huh. back to something about reading comprehension. And it's like, but the data point you were using that you want to strateg strategically move the needle on is vocab. Like, how do we pull the, I, I use the, the phrase pull the thread. That's one yeah. of my lines. But like, how do we pull that thread and say, okay, if the data point is telling us it's something about something's going on with vocab in fifth grade. Then in the strategic plan, I would love to see we're going to do A, B, and C to improve fifth grade vocab. We're going to build capacity so that every teacher and school leader understands this, this, and this about fifth grade vocab. Like literally, you would copy and paste fifth grade vocab in each of those boxes, more than copy and yeah. paste. But you would really build these like a strategic plan and kind of capacity building steps Yeah, that are just so tightly tied to that versus then kind of going bigger again or going yeah. smaller, but in a different direction. And sometimes that doesn't happen within strategic plans and within kind of the next step, you know, action steps that are um, baked into those plans. Yeah, I love that. Can I ask one clarifying question? Yeah. Because I love this because I do think you're right. The systems don't talk and I don't think we know how to mm -hmm. sometimes connect yep. the systems. And there's some broken links between, you know, what we what we see in the data and what we're trying to accomplish with a PD. And I think having those yep. things are really clearly linked up is so important. And then I would I would maybe sort of do a yes and a moment and think yeah. about are there do because I've seen people do that with constituent groups as well. 
you know, where we see this data and we have, you know, ELL learners, we have special education yes. population, and we're not thinking about that outside of our own little sort of world. Um, you know, I was going to a conference and I, I happened to, uh, you know, share a, an Uber with Emily Hanford uh, coming back mm -hmm. from something. And we were talking about this, this issue a little bit. And like in, in our work, we're, we're a school for kids with language-based learning disabilities. So mm -hmm. our focus is really like narrow in the sense that like we're not every public school in the world. We're not every independent school in the world. We have a very targeted sort of space and mission we're working to. Really, we bring in some of the neediest kids around reading, and we work to do some really great work in the science of reading and research-based uh, instruction. And we have some incredible outcomes as a result of that. And we've been doing all this advocacy work, rightfully so, for language-based learning disability students, right? And I think that that's this, for me, is where we've missed some of the reading wars kind of like mm -hmm. dialogue and opportunities, mm -hmm. is that we've been so focused on our little sort of constituent group within the context of that. And we've missed a bigger picture to say this is really about literacy. This is about literacy for all. Yeah. And and so I I just like I can't sort of like think about the siloing piece without also realizing that there's sub silos in the constituent groups with that space. Yeah. Yeah. No. I fully. I, I'm glad that you elevated that and would not want to kind of like discount that. But it's sort of slice or angle. Yeah. And I, and I love when when school districts and school leaders are start to kind of see pull up just a little bit because mm -hmm. we've had people say well. Yeah, but only like a few percent of our kids are dyslexic. <laughs> I'm yep. like, well, there's a lot of kids struggling from a literacy standpoint. Maybe we can maybe we can broaden our definition of what that means. Yep. And if we're supporting kids at all levels with good literacy practices, that's going to really raise all boats across the instructional spectrum, right? Yep. Yep. And so that's where we're, we've been trying to link up that conversation just a lot more. And um, so I just really appreciate the silo conversation that you brought. Thank you. Yeah. We only have a few minutes with you, Dr. Wolfen, and. I, I'll ask you that, I won't ask you, you don't have to answer now, but I would love to have you back just to get it. We, yeah. I feel like we just skimmed like the surface, yeah. right? We need, need a part two here. I know, but <laughs> um, in the final question, um, I think, you know, we've, we've talked about leadership and a lot of times on read, I'll take some moment to synthesize what the guest has said. So mm -hmm. what I hear you said about qualities of leaders and the act, really more, not even the qualities, the actions of leaders is being transparent on the purpose and the why, um, prioritizing um a culture of relationships, right? Of this, not only the collectiveness of being seen, but the collective responsibility. You also talked about coherence and capacity building, which I, there's an exorbitant amount of research on capacity building alone, not even like a, from a financial perspective, but for human resources and structures and infrastructure and a lot of the expertise that you've done. Um, and you also talked about conditions and then maintaining this sense of curiosity, of, of modeling learning. Mm -hmm. Are there any other insights and maybe current frameworks of leadership? Um, I know authentic leadership is something that I worked on a lot in my doctorate work, but for you, um, are there any frameworks or, or research that you can share with us um, about other actions leaders can take to really con to prioritize and facilitate reading reform? I think there are two that that we've we've implicitly talked about, and I don't always kind of brand my sort of the leadership frameworks, but I mean, the first one is kind of more obviously branded as sort of kind of distributed leadership. So again, moving away from the idea that one leader, whether it's a coach or a superintendent or um, a principal, um, that they're not, they're not attempting to do it all. And they're also not just devolving and dumping. That's one of my lines, but distributed leadership is not that either. Um, it's not sort of saying, oh, I'm handing that off to, you know, the chief academic officer just hands that off to the director of professional learning and never asks about it again. Instead, distributed leadership means that a chief academic officer would have sort of ideas and routines and ways to work with their director of professional learning to ensure that PD within and across that district, you know, really maps on to the strategic plan, really maps onto the curriculum, really reflects the science of reading and tenets of adult learning. Um, and there would be ways to kind of monitor and collect evidence on that. That actually dovetails to kind of the next leadership um, branch that I think is important to to keep in mind is sort of evidence-based leadership. And I'll hype the street data book again and sort of this notion that an evidence-based leader is using multiple forms of data in multiple ways, sharing it with different audiences and, and using it to make some strong evidence-based and contextualized decisions um, Thank you to support sharing. organizational change. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two great point. I love it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for both of those. And we'll have, we'll have those linked on the Read Podcast website. Final questions. We have two. We're going to choose two rapid fire questions. 
just for time and for Dr. Wolfen's time. Thank you so much for being on Read. But we'll end with just two. I'll choose one. Yeah. You choose one. And I'm just going to ask you to complete the sentence. So the last one I'm going to ask you is, um, one thing I hope for the future of reading reform and leadership is? I hope that we as adults do the work, invest in the work, stick to the work, and support the work so that every kid has amazing and I would say lump-filled reading instruction and literacy instruction every day, every year. I love that. Love Thank that you. Answer. Love filled. I think that school should be an act of love. I think the <laughs> education should be a, a really joyful act. So so on that kind of, because you've talked about, we talked about leaders a lot uh, today. Um, and I think one important thing in leadership is this notion of self-care. <laughs> so what for you is one sort of non-negotiable act of self-care? Running and riding my e-bike. Uh, I had go. to go with two, but yeah. Exer exercise is a beautiful thing. It helps mm -hmm. us do a lot of reset. I'm a big cyclist. I don't run. I wish I could run. Uh, I can, but I don't like it. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I'm so glad you got out there and do a little bit of a little bit of exercise that way. It's, it's good. Yes. Really good for us. We celebrate movement. Yeah. Fresh uh, air, Dr. sunshine, all of that. Yeah. 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 All yeah. Of may, may, it goes back to photosynthesis. All roads go yeah. back to uh -huh. science, science or reading, you know, or the wow. science of reading. Here we go. Uh -huh. I know. I love how you started with the conversation with science and we're ending it with science. Um, oh, so good. Dr. Wolfen, thank you so much for being um, a guest on the Read podcast. Jamie and I learned so much from you from about leadership to professional development to curriculum to school reform and conditions for change yeah this was fantastic and so i do i feel like you know i'm sorry if I, I talk too much here i just i love some of the focus that things that you're focusing on i think it's really important work and i think we want to help lift up that work so thank you for everything and thanks for being here today Thank you for, for paying attention to these really important issues. Thank you for helping me think through about think through these issues and how to sort of further frame these issues and refine these issues so that uh, yeah. they get out there and so we can do this great work out in schools. And I will extend an invitation. If you're ever back in the Connecticut area visiting some friends, come on, come on over, say hello. We'd love to give you a little I, tour of our program and, uh, and continue to stay connected. So thank you. I would love to make that happen. Thank you. It's very kind of you. Thank you. And um, I will say that at the end of every episode, I've started to have the guest, because you are the guest of honor, say the final word. And the final word is, it says, until next time, readers. So can I have you say the final word until next time, readers? Until next time, readers. Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much.